So again, welcome everyone uh, to this month's edition of Amplifying Voices. We have two really wonderful speakers lined up and I'm excited to get into those. Um, but first, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, as you joined, you may have noticed we will be recording this session, um, but we're also trying something new and also streaming it on Facebook Live. Uh, so you'll just see those two notifications pop up as you join the room. Um, and also, Brittany, did you want to take a moment and uh, introduce the survey for folks as well? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. I just want to uh, highlight this slide. We have up um, a group of Lorex students. This is um, a research exchange program we have um, uh, for students. They are in need of your help in answering a survey about evaluating mentorship in the aquatic sciences in the context of COVID-19. The survey is open through January 31st and it can be accessed either using this QR code right now, I'll also put the link in the chat or you can find it um, on, uh, listed on our homepage at aslo.org. All right, thank you. Wonderful, thanks Brittany. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Um, and... I will go ahead and Carolina, if you want to start um, getting set up and I will start your introduction. Um, so we have two really exciting early career researchers uh, who are going to be telling you about their work today. The first is going to be Carolina Rosa del Carvalho from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Dr. Del Carvalho mm -hmm. is an aquatic microbiologist and ecologist, and we're particularly excited to welcome her today um, because she's actually a member of ASLO's very own Early Career Committee. We're excited to host her here. She received both her Master of Science and her doctorate in agronomy uh, from the University of Sao Paulo, and during her studies, she participated in exchange programs um, as both a student at Griffith University in Australia, um, and more recently as a visiting scientist at the Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries in Stecklin, Germany. So today we'll be learning more about her dissertation work, which was focused primarily on pathways of oxic methane production in shallow lakes. So welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Haley. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, we can. Oh, yes, yes we you can. are all yeah. good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I'm Carolini. I'm a PhD and a former researcher at the University of São Paulo in Brazil. And today, I'm going to talk to you about cyanobacteria in the multiverse of methane production at Brazilian soda lakes. Um, okay. So methane is the second most important greenhouse gas right after CO2. However, it has a higher global warming potential effect. When we are talking about methane sources in aquatic environments, uh, the biogenic source that comes to our mind is the classical methanogenesis. This process is strictly um, done by archaea under anaerobic condition. So in an aquatic system, you would have methanogenesis happening in the bottom of the system or in the sediment. However, in the 90s, some studies started to show that there was an accumulation between 5 and 75% of methane in well-oxygenated surface waters. They started to call that the methane paradox, because how could you have methane accumulating in the presence of oxygen if methanogenesis only happens under anaerobic condition? One explanation for that would be that this methane in um, the presence it is already being produced in the presence of high concentrations of oxygen by other microorganisms than the archaea, for example, cyanobacteria. So because of this uh, production happening with, uh, in the presence of oxygen, they started to call this oxymethane production or OMP pathways. So now we know that there are many possibilities, the multiverse of possibilities for methane being produced. Uh, and uh, we can look for other uh, pathways to identify the sources of this gas. Many of these pathways are actually related to cyanobacteria's activity or association to other organisms. And that caught our attention to uh, a new source of looking for uh, greenhouse gas productions. 
So uh, why cyanobacteria? So uh, this uh, one of the characteristics of cyanobacteria is that they are able to overgrow and flourishing into blooms. Uh, when you have high concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, they can overgrow and uh, lead to a tropication process. Uh, these blooms, we already knew that they can contribute to fire methane uh, emissions because they create hypoxic dead zones. This means that they suffocate the environment, turns it into uh, anaerobic, so methanogenesis can freely happen and emit significant amount of methane. But now, because of this multiverse of possibilities, we know that cyanobacteria can be contributing directly for the methane emissions and uh, consequently contributing for global warming as well. Most of the blooms, they happen because of anthropogenic activities, but some of them are naturally, uh, naturally occurs in the environment. For example, the Brazilian Pantanal soda lakes. So the Pantanal is the largest wetland area in the world. In there, we have approximately 600 shallow lakes with high alkalinity levels and high salinity concentrations that turns them into extreme environments. But some of the, la the lakes have the presence of bloom-forming cyanobacteria like Arthrospira and Anabenopsis, which are very well adapted to these extreme conditions that this environment presents. It's important to say that because of the nutrients and the alkalinity levels, uh, we have there different types of lakes with and without the cyanobacterial blooms. And this depends on the hydrological cycles that we have in the season. And it's also important to say that the lakes are uh, isolated from each other. They don't connect. So we can consider each lake to be an individual system to study. So if the blooms that are naturally formed, why look for all oxymethane production pathways at the Pantanal lakes? In 2018, Barbiero and, and their, his group published this work where they identified that there was a high concentrations of methane being emitted from the lakes. And this was directly uh, related to the intensity of the cyanobacteria bloom. So they started to think that maybe the cyanobacteria could be directly uh, contributing for the methane concentrations they found because it was much more higher than it was already expected from this area. To start this search for the OMPs, we wanted at first to have a big picture of the pathways. So how to investigate them? We chose to go for metagenomic marker genes that we uh, have been describing in the literature for some oxymethane production pathways. So we could uh, see, uh, understand what we could focus better uh, and uh, what would be significant for our soda leaks. So uh, two of the, the genes we chose are related to the pathways of demethylation of organic compounds, such as phosphorus and sulfur organic forms. And two of them related with degradation of photosynthetic pigments, one for bacteriophil and the other one for chlorophyll. For that, we use a metagenome and did a functional analysis on the genes we wanted to look for. Um, we uh, collected uh, samples to uh, identify the gas, uh, the methane, dissolved methane concentrations in the waters. And we also selected some limnological and nutritional factors that could tell us if these genes are have a potential to be, um, to be expressed in the lakes. So we worked here with four soda lakes. Lakes four and eight present cyanobacterial bloom. Lake six has, has a dark color water because of the high concentration of humic compounds. And lake seven is a crystalline water lake. So our results show that the dissolved methane concentrations were much higher in the lakes with the presence of cyanobacterial blooms, followed by the lakes with crystalline waters. Then we did a redundancy analysis with the microbial community composition, the limnological factors, and the genes we wanted to look for for the LMPs. And related with the genes with blooms, that it's more, more important here for us to look up, uh, the, gene, the set of genes for PHN was the one that caught our attention at most for the oxymethane production. Uh, this gene is 
close to the lakes with plumes, but also close related to the methane concentrations and not so close to the orthophosphate concentration. And this is really important. I'm going to explain why uh, in the next slide. But the PHM gene is related with methyl phosphonate demethylation, which is an alternative phosphorus source pathway. So when, it means that we, we don't want uh, a lot of orthophosphate present in the water for this pathway to be happening. So what is the demethylation of organic phosphorus or CP lyase pathway? Here we have the whole cluster for the PHN genes. Uh, the PHAJ gene is the most important here because it's going to be transcribed into the uh, translated into the CP lyase enzyme. That's the one that degradates the phosphorus uh, organic molecule. So here we have methyl phosphonate, the simplest form of phosphonate we have, and is characterized by the presence of a carbophosphorus bond. So we have here cyanobacteria uptaking this methyl phosphonate. The P, uh, PHN gene or CP lyase enzyme is going to break the carbophosphorus bond. We have phosphorus being consumed by the microorganism and the methane being emitted as a subproduct. So it's important here to have in mind that this is a primary phosphorus metabolism. So what we have is that where the, uh, we find the highest activity for the CP lyase enzyme is where we have the low presence of phosphate. So that's why our results uh, can uh, be reliable to say that there is a potential for these genes to be being expressed in the soda lakes and this pathway to be occurring as the lake, uh, the gene is not very close related to orthophosphate concentrations. Okay, so the pathway has a potential to happen, but are the cyanobacteria performing this pathway? To understand that, we did a taxonomic analysis based on the gene for the CP lyase pathway. We looked into genomic and metagenomic data for, for, uh, from two different seasons, a dry season and a wet season. And we also include one more lake with cyanobacteria blooms to do this screening for our marker genes. The results we got is that we do have a, a community in the lake that is responsible for, for this pathway. So it can happen and we have microorganisms doing it, but especially we have cyanobacteria doing it uh, both on the lakes with cyanobacterial blooms, lake eight and lake nine, for both seasons, dry and flooded season. But which cyanobacteria specifically can we be looking for uh, to be performing the OMP through demethylation of phosphorus? So we identified five MEGs, which are metagenome assembled genomes that have the whole cluster for phosphonate degradation. And we identified these MEGs as hafidiopsis. So this is um, a cyanobacteria that are not responsible for the bloom at the Pantanal Lake. So we have the pathway happening, is Hapidiopsis doing it, but not the blooms. So we cannot assure how much significant that, that this contribution could be, but it's happening. But what about the blooms? This is the one that we, we want to know if the blooms are producing methane. For that, we looked into another multi universe of our multiverse of possibilities for methane production. And uh, we looked up into this work from Dr. Mina Bezic from, uh, published in 2020, where they suggested that the products generated during photosynthesis serve as precursors for methane production. The mechanisms is still unknown, but they uh, did a lot of tests using inhibitors of photosynthesis, and that showed to inhibit methane production. So they thought that they understand that there is a relation between this process, but still many gaps to fill. So we started to look for this one to, um, to see if the balloons could uh, perform in this pathway. So you, we used uh, isolated strains from the blooms, Arthrospira and Anamenopsis, and we uh, monitored them through time using membrane inlet mass spectrometry equi equipment. So we could identify the gas concentrations and the production rate of methane from the isolates. So uh, at first, let, let's look into the Anamenopsis data. Here in blue, we have the oxygen concentrations. In purple is the methane concentration and the dotted line means the methane production. 
uh, the background in white is the when the light was on, and the background in the uh, gray background is when the light was off. So what we see here for both anabenopsis strains is that during the light period, both of them has a high uh, peak of oxygen, uh, higher at the first moment. And this means that we have oxygen increasing. So we, this is probably photosynthesis happening. And when we are talking about the methane production, we see a lot of peaks of production, not very continuous, but we see the production happening specifically during the presence of light. So we do have them producing methane, but exclusively in the presence of light and not very continuously. So we thought that maybe that's something else we could see through time. So for the anabenopsis train, we did a long ru longer running. So we, we, we could maybe identify that there was that if something changes through time. So what we have here is that at first, you see a high peak of methane production in the dark. And then this, these peaks are adjusting itself to the period of when the light was on. And we have small peaks of production when the light was off. And you can also see that the peaks goes all together with the oxygen uh, concentrations. So we can see here that methane is being produced in the presence of oxygen, but specifically it adjusted itself to the presence of light. This tells us that the methane uh, production by cyanobacteria uh, it go, is a process that goes with the circadian cycle of these organisms. So uh, when it's right exposed to the uh, light, it, there is a, a, a change on the production, but as it's uh, establishing itself to the uh, uh, experiment conditions, we see that it's, it flows continually, continuously, the production of methane in the presence of oxygen. So what we have here is that the blooms are also producing methane through another pathway, but in the presence of light as well, under light, uh, in the presence of oxygen, under light and irradiation. So what we can see is that in our soda lakes, we have at least two universes of methane production alternatives. We have demethylation of organic compounds, specifically phosphorus, and we also have the blooms, which are mostly interesting to us during the photosynthetic pathway. But talking about multiverse, which pathway, which OMP pathway is the dominant one? So for us, both of them can be happening. Uh, we have evidence that both of them can be happening, but uh, the, the pathway related to photosynthesis uh, is the one that gets more attention because as the bloom takes the whole uh, area of aquatic system, we would have a much more significant uh, production through this pathway than by uh, phosphorus degradation. So because of the whole physical, chemical, limnological, nutritional conditions that the soda lake presents and because they are different from each other, each lake is gonna have a different OMP happening. But uh, we, uh, many of them can be happening actually at the same time. That's why we're talking about multiverses. But two of them for us are the main ones, the one related with photosynthesis and the one related with the methylation of methyl phosphonate. And we think they are the ones that are contributing to the really high concentrations that the soda lakes with cyanobacteria blooms have been uh, already presented. And this uh, help us to investigate better and understand why this is happening and how to mitigate these emissions at the uh, Brazilian soda lakes. Um, okay, so that's it. I would like to acknowledge the financial agencies and the institutions where this work happened and who supported it to happen. And also everyone who's involved somehow in the project, especially my supervisors in Brazil, Professor Marli Fiore, and in Germany, Professor Hans-Peter Grosset. And I would like to thank you for our, your attention. Those are my contacts. And if you have any further questions, I'll be glad to take them. So thank you. Wonderful.
Thank you so much, Carolina. That was wonderful. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to uh, to raise your hand or type them in the chat. Uh, we have time. We can probably take a, a question or two prior to moving on to the next speaker. And Fanina, if we have any questions coming through Facebook, please uh, mm -hmm. please let me know. I'll keep an eye on the chat. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I have a question. <laughs> no one else does at the moment. Um, I thought those uh, the sort of daily or diol patterning of methane production and especially how it it adjusted to it over time was really neat to see. I uh, am not very familiar with the methane cycle, but do you do you know of any instances where there might be uh, methanotrophy that's also happening on that kind of a daily diol cycle or like any potential for those? to uh, production and consumption processes to somehow be linked in sync with one another? Yeah, so for this experiment, we um, made sure that this that we understand that uh, we identified that this was the pathway happening. So I checked for the presence of methanogenics and we didn't find any in our cultures. So this archaeometanogenesis um, couldn't be happening. And the, this uh, cyanobacteria we tested, they are not able to consume phosphonate. So they can, this could also not be happening. So we are more sure that, um, that this is linked with what we were looking for with photosynthetic process. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question too, Caroline. Um, is there any way uh, how to estimate how much the different pathways can contribute to the methane production? Mm, maybe using quantifying these microorganisms, we could estimate from what we got in the lab. And we also have uh, this uh, data of uh, fluxes of methane production and dissolved methane from the lakes. So we could, we are trying to do that to estimate at least for the blooms, the, how this could be, um, how significant, how they could be contributing. But to differentiate them, I'm not sure, maybe isotopic analysis or, yeah. I would go. Yeah, to I would then. assume as isotopic analysis should give you the best hint because uh, um, methane from the uh, photosynthesis related uh, OMP should have a very different signal from the one uh, of the other pathways. You could yeah. probably also label to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, yeah. Carolina. Um, all you, right, Lily. so I think we'll probably move on to Luis and then we'll have a, sort of a joint Q&A session at the end if we've got a little bit of time. So if uh, if you ha think of a question, uh, feel free to just hang on to it until the end. Um, Luis, if you want to go ahead and start uh, setting up your slides as I introduce you, just make sure everything's going OK. Um, okay. So next, uh, our second speaker is going to be uh, Luis Henri Borgin from the Federal University of Rio Grande. Uh, Mr. Borgin is a marine biogeochemist who received his Master of Science in Oceanography from the Federal University of Santa Catarina, and he's currently pursuing his doctorate at the Federal University of Rio Grande. He has also studied abroad at the University of Lisbon in Portugal uh, and has accrued significant experience working on board uh, cruise vessels and processing data collected by oceanographic instruments. So today he will be presenting some of his work that combines th these two approaches, namely oceanographic sampling and numerical modeling uh, to examine carbon cycling and more specifically ecosystem metabolism in coastal regions. So welcome Luis, take it away. Hello, hello, uh, hello. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can uh, hear you. Okay, so my name is Luis Enrique Bergin, uh, PhD Hi. student. Hello. 
uh, PhD student at Universidade Federal do Rio Grande, Brazil. Uh, my advisor is Professor Eunice da Costa Machado, and I have two co-advisors, Elisa Fernandes and Carlo Rafael Mendes. My thesis project is entitled Aquatic Ecosystem Metabolism of the Patos Lagoon Story, a multi-scale multi, uh, approach. Take so the story, uh, stories represent key components for the biogeochemical cycling because it's positioned between land and ocean, which the process are influenced by a combination of diverse metoceanographic forcing factors that happens in different spatiotemporal scales. Along the story in gradient, the elements are transformed by these factors as well as by the organic matter production, consumption, also called respiration. So the balance between production and respiration called metabolism determines, for example, the potential of the story to accumulate and or consume or export carbon to the adjacent continental shelf, uh, absorb uh, or export carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The Patos Lagoon story is located in the lower section of the Patos Lagoon, southern Brazil, because the microtidal uh, regime, the system is mainly controlled by the combination of uh, continental runoff and the wind. Né? When the wind is from southwest, the seawater intrusion occurs, and during northeast winds, the ebb predominates. Higher concentrations of nutrients and chlorophyll A is observed between the beginning of uh, the spring to the early summer when the continental runoff is, is still high enough. It is believed that, at least in shallow areas, the aquatic ecosystem uh, metabolism is autotrophic, mainly autotrophic most of the year, and dur except during winter at low solar radiation. And here in the map, uh, we have uh, two stations, one and two, where metoceanographic buoys of the Brazilian Coastal Monitoring System, uh, Syncosta, uh, buoys RS1, RS2 are in operation. The main gaps are that the majority of the aquatic ecosystem metabolism uh, studies was carried out in the Northern Hemisphere. There are few and older studies developed at the Patos Laguna Tour, and the recent ones only addresses bacterial plankton and chlorophyll A as primary production indicative. But besides that, the, the in situ and localized methodological approaches uh, is space and time limited. So the solution uh, for this issue is to the integration of manual and automatic in situ sampling and numerical modeling. Wow, I didn't know that. Therefore, the main goal of this study is to investigate uh, how the aquatic ecosystem metabolism at the Patos Laguna story respond to the main metoceanographic forcing factors in different spatiotemporal scales. And the specific ones uh, are to estimate the primary production, organic matter uh, consumption, uh, decomposition, that is the respiration rates, assess the relation between metoceanographic variability, the physical chemical parameters and ecosystem metabolism, associate the ecosystem metabolism with the phytoplankton assemblage, and finally to estimate the carbon mass balance in distinct periods of winds and river flow. So to achieve these goals, we separated the project into two steps. The first one, uh, comprises two in situ approaches. The first one limited in time and space scales. The second one expands the, the metabolism estimates in time. And finally, the second step, third approach by numerical modeling that expands the estimates in both time and space scales. A 30 day sample. A uh, 30-day sampling campaign was carried out between February and March 2021. 
uh, where daily in situ sampling was performed at three depths for nutrients, dissolved oxygen, photosynthetic pigments, uh, pH, total carbon, and alkalinity by laboratorial analysis, and some other variables along all the water column uh, by a Hinkle multiparametric probe. In situ uh, ecosystem metabolism experiments was performed at the stations one and two, and uh, the aquatic ecosystem metabolism was also assessed by uh, the open water method uh, by, by means of dissolved oxygen and meteorological data from the Sin Costa buoy probes. Now I will present for you the results and discussion of the first approach, whose resulting article is under review in the Journal of Marine Systems. It is possible to note that all rates decreased from February to, to March, and the rates accompany each other. That is, uh, when the gross primary production rises, the respiration also rises, uh, and vice versa. The negative values of net pelagic ecosystem, the yellow line, uh, review the predominance of heterotrophic conditions on both stations. We, com we compared these results with old ones obtained in the Patos Laguna story by Professor Abreu, uh, with uh, the results of the second approach, I will show you later. Uh, regarding the Professor Abreu results, we see much higher Guys, net pro go. primary production than Abreu, just about 10 minutes. which found that autotrophic conditions. Okay. Can you close your mic, please? I, I'm just, um, no. I'm uh, sorry about that. The, Continue. I'll be back in five no, minutes. No problem. Both the, the discrepant rates and the net autotrophism were attributed to the much shallow, uh, shallow Mom, area me. experimented by Abreu. However, if we look to the results obtained before the vertical and daily integration, we reached to similar results of 2.3 and 2 millimol of oxygen per cubic meter per hour. So in general, our results were within the range of those found in other studies worldwide. Now, seeking to understand the variation of the metabolic rates, I will show the metastonographic data. The first panel uh, shows the main Patos Lagoon tributaries water flow, blue and orange lines, and the whole lagoon uh, water residence time in black for some months before the sampling campaign. The results review a drought condition and the non-influence of river flow in the Asturian area during the sampling campaign at the end of this graph. The middle panel shows the meridional wind speed in which positive values represent snorkeling winds and negative southerly. It's possible to see um, uh, in the bottom panel which represents the water flow of the main uh, study access channel uh, during the campaign, that northerly winds promote the outflow of study waters towards the ocean, here also represented by positive values, and southerly winds promoting the inflow of coastal waters into the estuary. This pattern could also be seen in the Hofmuller salinity graphics with alternating uh, warm and cold colors in both station one on the top left hand side and uh, and station two on the bottom. On the other hand, temperature was more constant throughout the time in both stations. The dissolved inorganic nutrients assessment reveals the primary production nitrogen limitation with N to P uh, ratios always lower than 16 to 1 while phosphate and silicate were not limiting. The phytoplankton assemblage dynamics was modulated by the wind-induced salinity changes as observed by other studies. The time series of phytoplankton groups contribution to total chlorophyll A shows the predominance of diatoms in, in blue, always higher than 50% in, in both stations. 
uh, on station one, Cryptophytes uh, was the second most abundant, and Cyanobacteria is the third, while in, uh, in the station two, Cyanobacteria was more abundant than the Cryptophytes. Looking at the data ordination on the principal component analysis uh, with some relations among variables corroborated by the correlation matrix, the gross primary production as well as the respiration removed from the PCA due to the collinearity, uh, we see clearly higher rates in surface layers, uh, green symbols, and larger influence of photosynthetically active radiation uh, affected by the turbidity coming from the bottom, uh, black symbols, but also coming from coastal waters, probably the intrusion of plata plume water uh, into the estuary identified by the association of turbidity, salinity, uh, and phosphates characteristic of this water mass, which probably is an important factor determining the biogeochemical dynamics and metabolism in the Patas Laguna story. Looking at the phytoplankton group's contribution in relation to the metabolic rates, it is obvious the larger influence of diatoms due to its predominance, but the larger contribution of prasinophytes and clepitophytes to the gross primary production, and cyanobacteria, uh, dinoflagellates, and chlorophytes to the respiration. Uh, it is likely the specific contribution uh, occurs due to larger photosynthetic efficiency of these groups. Uh, it's advantage of some uh, groups about others in specific conditions of nutrients and larger respiration rates of these other groups. Now let's move on the, onto the results of the second approach whose out article is under review in the studies and costs. The metabolic rates by the open water method also shows the predominance of net heterotrophic conditions with uh, yellow squares always below the zero line. It was expected because this method captured the benthic metabolism in which the euphotic zone rarely reaches the bottom therefore né, leading to the even higher respiration rates. In this graphic, it's possible to note the influence of an extratropical cyclone that occurred in the spring of 2016, uh, with very larger pluviometry and river runoff that affected the biogeochemical dynamics in the Asturi in the two months after that event. The seasonal average head rates show higher rates of both gross primary production represented by the circles and respiration diamonds in spring and summer when the system was more heterotrophic, these uh, vertical bars. Spring and summer uh, were not significantly different for the three rates, while autumn and winter were equal for respiration and net metabolism, but different for gross primary production. We also made a comparison among years. However, to be possible, we had to take just the spring's data for 2016, 17, skip 2018, 2019, and 20 uh, due to greater data availability. Therefore, in fact, this is not an interannual analysis, but a comparison among springs. That at the extratropical cyclone in 2016 is evident with larger uh, gross primary production, but mainly respiration rates, uh, likely resultant uh, from the organic matter advection into the story with its decomposition. The gross primary production and respiration rates were different between 2017, 19, and 20, but the net metabolism was equal. Talking about the literature survey, by comparing the results with the first approach, 
we reached to similar results with slightly higher rates obtained from the open water method since it captures the benthic metabolism, while the first approach only the water column. Therefore, since the aquatic zone rarely reaches the bottom, we see higher net heterotrophy here. But uh, when comparing with uh, stu other stories worldwide, we see much higher net heterotrophy in the Patas Lagoon channel sites, what draws attention. The most likely reason for that, again, is the high turbidity and the measured depth in which the aquatic zone has really reached the bottom. Uh, differently for, from, uh, for example, the Muhel uh, study at Channel Sites in Pensacola Bay, where they found high respiration rates, but with the contribution of many days, the aquatic zone reached the bottom. In average, they got a value next to a neutral condition, whereas in our site, the net heterotrophy uh, was more frequent and constant throughout the time. In this article, we also performed the same analysis. The gross primary production seems to be higher in summer and community respiration in spring, mainly affected by the winds, photosynthetically active radiation, temperature, salinity, and turbidity. These variables uh, contribute to explain rates, uh, the rates oscillations, but the main reason to the net heterotrophy, repeating one more time to emphasize it, is the high turbidity uh, and the depth in which the, the eophotic zone rarely reached the bottom. Therefore, uh, leading to the prevalence of respiration rates throughout the year. Okay, uh, the first step is concluded, as well as uh, the data to be used for the second step by numerical modeling, that is for the calibration and validation of the model. The hydrodynamic model, which gives basis for the ecological modeling is validated. In this slide, just to illustrate for you, the mesh grid, uh, bathymetry, and other settings, such as boundary conditions. So the model was validated by comparing observed and calculated water level of two stations, both with root mean absolute error lower than 0 0.2, considered as excellent, and also for the current speed from ADCPs of the Sincosta boys, also excellent for the two boys inside this jury and as good for that in the inner shelf. Now we are working in the ecological model with the Delphi 3 d water quality module. The purpose is to get the metabolism in an integrated view for the entire Patos Laguna story and to estimate the carbon mass balance between the story and the ocean. It is expected the, to be completed by September this year, when I will defend my, my thesis. Thank you all and also the funding programs. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Luis. That was a wonderful talk. Um, folks, if you have a question, again, feel free to either raise your hand or you can un unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, or if you prefer to write it in the chat, that's fine too. Um, and Fanina, I'll keep an eye on it uh, once more in case there's anything coming in from Facebook. Um, but let me just take a look at our participants. Should I close the, stop the oh, sharing? However, however you're comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if you'll have to reference any of it. Um, let's see here. Um, all right. Uh, well, I uh, I wanted to ask a question. Okay, so no questions so far from Facebook. I wanted to ask a question about the um, that cyclone event that you showed that happened um, earlier in I think it was 2015 or 2016, where you saw those really high rates of um, both production, but primarily respiration. It looked like the system was heterotrophic at that point. Um, 
Uh, I'm curious, do those kinds of events happen often, given that it's such an autotrophic system? Are those sort of frequent events that come in and sort of, you know, reset things and then it goes back, it heads back towards autotrophy or are cyclones of that magnitude fairly infrequent in this system? Uh, so we just uh, saw the, uh, an event like that once since the, the metoceanographic voice uh, was in operation. Uh, so I think this is not so frequent, but is is possible to come uh, even more frequent do the the um, uh, for example El Nino and La Nina events that affected the the pluviometry in southern Brazil. Got it. There. And do they do they occur during certain seasons? I mean, is it exacerbating like already heterotrophic conditions during the winter? Sorry, can you speak slowly? Yeah, I didn't sorry. understand it's, your question. Sorry, is are the cyclones <laughs> happening in summer when it's when it's typically autotrophic, so it's changing it to heterotrophic, or are the cyclones coming in in winter when it's already heterotrophic and making it more so? Okay, uh, uh, normally is in during spring. The 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 that events with larger pluviometry uh, normally occurs in uh, the the um, late spring and early summer. I, we did not observe the, uh, a change uh, between uh, seasons. Got it. Thank you. Um, let's see if there's any further questions. If anyone has any questions for either of our speakers, um, we're happy to open up the floor. Um, but also, I just certainly encourage you to uh, check out our Twitter page if you want to get in contact with either of our speakers um, after after these wonderful presentations. And um, as always, we'll be putting these recordings both on the ASLO website as well as YouTube, and we'll be making those available shortly. Um, so if you'd like to share these with anyone, uh, they should be available. Um, and, uh, and going forward, I'd encourage folks to keep an eye on Facebook as well. I think we're going to continue uh, trying to stream it there. Uh, so whatever venue is best for you, we really appreciate everyone coming. Um, and I wanted to take a moment and just thank both of our speakers for uh, giving such wonderful presentations. <laughs> and uh, and we'll stick around for a little bit, um, in, but in case folks have to head out to wherever they're going next, um, thanks for coming. And uh, And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>